As part of Dirty Linen's summer series, I'm going to share some stories from time to time about my journey, things that have happened to me. And I thought I'd start by telling you how I became a food writer or how food writing really picked me up and just grabbed me and wouldn't let me go. I was working as a travel author for Lonely Planet, the travel publisher. We did travel guides to destinations all around the world and I'd been lucky enough to do some of those books. Started in New South Wales, went up the snowy mountain, locked my keys in my car, uh, very auspicious beginnings, went to Bulgaria, dove into the Black Sea when it was 10 degrees, very chilly, lots of great adventures. People think that travel writing is glamorous and fun and even though you feel at every point really lucky to be doing it, there's a certain style of guidebook writing that means you're travelling very quickly and it's very detail-oriented. So while people might imagine that you're drinking martinis by the pool, what you're really doing is tramping up five flights of stairs to a dingy youth hostel and checking if there's bed bugs, wondering if the showers are hot. And you, instead of uh, traipsing around a gallery, immersing yourself in great art, you're looking out for where the toilets are, checking the opening hours and working out which bus uh, you need to catch to get there in the first place. So it's great, but it's a certain type of, of writing and you have to move really quickly and you have to focus on the stuff that for other people is just the, the little details, but for you, it's what it's all about. Anyway, it's so transpired that uh, Lonely Planet started a series of guides to world cuisine and they wondered if I'd like to write the guide to Turkish food. For sure, I said. So instead of uh, doing all the stuff that, you know, I've just told you about, the, the bus stops, the youth hostels, the cold or hot showers and the bed bugs, it was going to be just going somewhere to eat. You want me to go to Turkey to eat? Yep, I reckon I can do that. There was something that I knew I would need to do before I could get on the plane and that was to transition my diet from <laughs> vegetarian to carnivorous. Uh, I'd become vegetarian when I had one of those boyfriends who was such a rabid vegetarian that to eat meat uh, anywhere near him was a matter of such great personal crisis that um, I just stopped. It was, it, was, it was too much hassle. But anyway, that boyfriend was in my past and meat eating was in my future. So I uh, treated myself to a um, get back on the bandwagon steak and jumped on a plane to Turkey. I loved it straight away. It was instantly so fascinating, so interesting, and such a great way to connect with people. Instead of train timetables and opening hours, I was instantly into the center of Istanbul and looking for great flavors. Uh, I'd done a lot of research before I left. I'd read lots of books and asked lots of questions of um, Turkish people and other people that had traveled to Turkey before and my first mission that I set up for myself in Istanbul was to find a particular yogurt, Kaimak, a sort of a sort of clotted cream and I'd been told that there was you know the, the best Kaimak that you could find was um, just a little bit along the Bosphorus and uh, take a certain boat, go down a certain laneway and you're going to find someone who was making this uh, this this clotted clotted cream cheese like beautiful substance. So there I was. I, I got on the ferry. I went down the laneway. I found this little um, garage workshop where people were culturing milk and I just nosed my way in there and got to try it, got to buy some and just felt like I was really off on my big adventure. Right from the beginning, the things that I still love about food writing were in absolute evidence. It was the fact that you could connect through language barriers, through understanding barriers, through, through really starting off from a place of absolute ignorance and through just enthusiasm and openness and a willing to put anything in my mouth. Uh, I found that I was able to really connect with people and to not only learn about what they were making, but to get some of the context for it. 
you start talking to somebody about what's on their plate for lunch and before too long you're, you're hearing stories about the grandfather that came over the mountains with the goats and um, settled in a certain village and started making a certain thing and it's instantly it's about history it's about culture and it's about the things that make people's lives really rich and meaningful I was absolutely seduced by that some of the places that I went will be with me forever I remember being in Gaziantep, which is um, southeastern Turkey and very famous for its stretchy ice cream, where the ice cream vendors stretch the ice cream between uh, two poles, like a skipping rope. And some of the stories that you hear about this ice cream, which is made stretchy with um, salep, the, a sap that comes from the root of a particular orchid. Uh, and gives the ice cream its particular stretchy texture. And you know you've done it right if um, you can use that ice cream, <laughs> if, it, if you can turn it into such a thick rope that it's strong enough to tow a car. Now, I never actually saw this demonstrated, but if you eat this, um, eat this beautiful Donderma, this uh, stretchy ice cream, then you, you do get a sense of how thick and textured and sappy and stretchy it is. Um, it melts really, really slowly and uh, it, the vendors um, are prone to doing tricks with it so that they won't just put it in a cone, they'll do all kinds of dancing tricks. Um, whipping it away from you, turning it upside down, hiding it behind your back, just whipping it around in all kinds of interesting permutations so that eating ice cream isn't just about having a sweet treat, it's about being treated to a show um, before you even get your hands on your Don Derma. One thing that I really loved about my travels in Turkey was the way that I could access the women's culture. In Turkey, is a place where a lot of the public culture is is a men's space. So there'd be a lot of um, tea houses where it would mostly be men. Uh, a lot of public spaces are dominated by men. And in fact, one of the first things that I bought in Turkey was a wedding ring to put on my <laughs> ring finger because it was just a small defence against being uh, constantly hassled and yeah. Um, questioned and indeed followed. A wedding ring wasn't really a, a magic shield, um, but I did have to speak often of a, a phantom husband that I had to invent who was always just around the corner and about to greet me. Through my interest in food, I was able to get into some of the women's spaces and it, that was really amazing. And I think one of the things that I just loved was how the barriers would come down. So in the public spaces, women were often uh, you know, they were discarved and quite demure and not very outspoken. But in, I remember being in central Turkey in Cappadocia and, and going down a laneway. I think it was, it was some kind of bean, green bean that had been harvested and I could see big piles of it piled on, on cloths um, down a laneway. And I just, I just wandered down there and I just lurked there for a bit, showed my interest, but I was, um, I was sort of welcomed into this gathering of women that were at the sort of back doors of their homes in the laneway and they were all preparing these beans. I think they were going to be drying them on the rooftops and preserving them for, uh, for winter. And, you know, just using my very rudimentary Turkish, some of them spoke a little bit of German, which I could battle my way through as well. They were so fun and funny and so ribald. They were, you know, gesturing to, uh, to my uh, <laughs> to my pretend wedding ring, trying to get information about my husband. I think I told them that, you know, my husband was a fantasy, and they were just they were just telling dirty jokes. They were cheeky. They were funny, and they were incredibly skilled. Just watching their skilled fingers um, dealing with these beans was was really impressive. It was. Another example of the way that food and curiosity about food can take you places that you wouldn't otherwise have access to. Part of my research for this book, it was, it was called World Food Turkey. And my role or my job as the author of this book was to research regional dishes 
from each region of Turkey, but also to talk about the culture of Turkish food and about dishes that were eaten for particular purposes or at particular times. And there was one soup that I had to get my head around, had to get my mouth around. It's a, uh, a soup that's made with all kinds of offal, a spicy soup, a spicy rich soup, and it's only served very late at night and it's supposed to uh, be a, a prophylactic against hangovers. So these stalls that only sell this particular intestine soup pop up way after midnight and until dawn in some of the, um, the laneways and alleys around the sort of the nightlife centres. And there's no, there was no way for me to try this soup apart from by staying up and <laughs> finding one of these places when they popped up. So I found myself a chaperone because, um, yeah, that was that was going to be necessary. There weren't many single women, well, no, nah, there were no single women wandering around um, looking for this soup. And in fact, there weren't even any chaperoned women uh, looking for this soup. It was a very male dominated arena. But anyway, I made friends with a Turkish pilot and he took me to a place where he knew the soup would be. And just to um, really test its efficacy, I also felt it was um, my duty to have a few drinks beforehand just to see if the soup did the job of stopping me feeling a little bit shabby the next day. Anyway, we found a stall, we ate the soup, I chewed on the gristly bits, and lo and behold, I felt absolutely bright and sparky the next day. <laughs> so, magic soup. Uh, can't say that it's a cure that I've replicated for myself here in Australia, but it was certainly part of the rich cultural experience that I had in Turkey. So I travelled around Turkey probably, I don't know, it was, it was about two months and it was so enjoyable. It was very filling. <laughs> I think I um, needed to buy some drawstring pants along the way. It was so fun and so rich and interesting. And I think I all the things that I still feel about food writing really crystallised for me on that trip. And that was this idea that I was always going to have more to learn. Every village I went to in Turkey, I learned something new. And, you know, I did, I did the traveling and the eating, but I also uh, did a lot of library research, um, both before, after and during uh, the trip. So I always had this idea of celebrating my own ignorance because it gave me the opportunity to learn more and learning more to me was always a way to connect with the person that I was sitting with or the next place I was going to, the person that was growing something or producing some kind of food. It was always an excuse to ask questions and to connect with people. And those conversations that I was then able to have were about food, but they were so much about culture and history and really getting to the heart of what mattered to people. It's something that I still feel so grateful to be able to do today and, and certainly in this podcast is an amazing way to do it. So while I was writing, researching, eating myself silly, doing this guide to Turkish cuisine for Lonely Planet, I felt grateful every moment, not only because it was so much fun along the way, but because I knew that it had opened me up to a new career that was something that I was going to want to pursue pretty much forever. I just absolutely loved it and it set me on the path that I'm still on today. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about. We spend a week thrashing around each issue, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you.